Uh, welcome to uh, our presentation, our second presentation this morning, uh, the Derelict Heritage Properties and the City of Ottawa Initiative. I'll introduce our two guest speakers. Linda Anderson holds the position of Chief Bylaw and Regulatory Services with the City of Ottawa. She has worked in municipal government for 25 years. In 2013, Linda took the lead in addressing the issue of dozens of vacant derelict properties, properties in the City of Ottawa through both proactive enforcement of the existing property standards regulations and the introduction of enhanced bylaw, which specifically addresses both vacant and heritage properties. Sally Coots has worked for the City of Ottawa for 22 years as heritage planner in the Planning and Growth Management Department, Heritage Section. Her work involves finding a balance between cultural heritage conservation and making allowances for change, growth, and development. Ladies, it's all yours. Thank you. Everybody hear me all right? Good, thank you. It's okay, don't make it. Okay, perfect. Thank you and good morning. Um, I will uh, give you some background on the, the, why we uh, took on this initiative and the development of the bylaw to include the heritage uh, component. And uh, Sally will uh, give you more information about the heritage characteristics, the, how we're dealing with heritage in Ottawa. Uh, I should tell you right off the, right from the beginning, that uh, my knowledge about heritage attributes and the Heritage Act is very limited and luckily have people like Sally uh, at the City of Ottawa that can assist us when we're dealing with these issues. So to give you some background into why uh, the City of Ottawa took on this initiative, I should, I should mention that many municip there are several municipalities in, this, in the province of Ontario already have property standards bylaws with an entire section devoted to heritage. Uh, this is not new. Um, this is something that municipalities and uh, the City of London for, is the one that stands out in my mind uh, because we did a lot of cutting and pasting of their bylaw when we were developing ours. Um, what has happened over the years in the City of Ottawa, particularly in the area called Lower Town, which is a designated heritage area, is that one particular individual has bought up many, many properties in that area. and just sat with them vacant for decades. Um, in the City of Ottawa, we refer to it as heritage, or, uh, demolition by neglect. Um, because the area is protected under heritage and because it's in a demolition control area, it's very difficult for property owners to, well, it's not difficult, but there's a lot of red tape involved with them redeveloping the property. So last spring april of 2013 i was called to a meeting in the mayor's office um, the mayor and the ward councillor were there and their question was why is this happening why are these buildings falling apart uh, what can we do about it and having the political will to move on this issue was probably the single most uh, empowering tool that we had um, over the years for many decades because of resource limitations, the former city of Ottawa and then the new city of Ottawa had not taken a proactive approach to dealing with vacant properties or heritage properties. Rather, uh, we, re we reacted to complaints about them and we simply required that the property owner board up those properties. But nothing further had been done for the most part. <clears throat> The former bylaw as well, our property standards bylaw, in actual fact, did not properly define a vacant building. So at the outset, when we started this project, we were somewhat limited legally, although we just moved forward and waited for somebody to challenge us until we got the new by, so we had the new bylaw in place. So, um, Many of the vacant properties, particularly in the lower town area of Ottawa, were in fact in designated heritage areas. And several other properties in Ottawa that were vacant or are vacant are also heritage buildings. So um, after meeting with the mayor and the ward councillor, we started to develop a strategy. 
Uh, first and foremost, what we committed to do was to meet with the Built Heritage Subcommittee, uh, which we did in April of 2013, to give them an overview and get their blessing on our proposed strategy to address the heritage buildings or properties in the City of Ottawa. Um, so that was the first and foremost that we did. Uh, the strategy we hoped that used was to hope to tackle the problem of heritage buildings that had been left vacant and beyond repair and were deemed to be cost prohibitive, so in most cases would have to be torn down. Uh, our chief building official made a comment uh, at the outset which has been very helpful and we've repeated it often. Our new regulations and our new approach will not undo the 30 or 40 years of neglect that have occurred prior to this. But what we've done is draw a line and going forward we are committed to saving these buildings and wherever possible we're going back to try and save some of the buildings that are already there. After meeting with the Heritage Subcommittee, we went on to meet with our Community and Protective Services Committee and the Council of the City of Ottawa to get their approval for our strategy as well. So our strategy recommended the improved maintenance of vacant buildings by undertaking proactive enforcement, so not waiting for complaints, but rather going out and proactively enforcing vacant buildings using the existing regulations but in the longer term, it was our intention to strengthen these regulations as well as potentially introduce new ones. As part of the report, the new mechanism to address vacant buildings were proposed to review uh, and the potential considerations of the same. Staff was directed to undertake a number of initiatives, Council directed us to do that, and we were instructed to report back in September of 2013, so we didn't have a lot of time. So we started right away. I assigned two property standards officers. This became virtually their full-time job last summer. Staff were also asked to consistently consult with the Built Heritage Subcommittee on any of our future proposals, and this is certainly where people like Sally were of invaluable help to us. So the authority to introduce a property standards bylaw is, is in the Building Code Act. So we've had a property standards bylaw in Ottawa for decades and decades and decades. So the authority for that is, is housed in the Ontario Building Code Act. Um, as part of our report for the September we reviewed the existing bylaws to determine whether or not there was a potential to strengthen the existing provisions to require a higher standard of maintenance of vacant land and buildings to improve appearance and to prevent the deterioration of those buildings. Included in the discussion of new mechanism to address vacant buildings was the potential to develop and enforce through specific bylaw provisions specific standards pursuant to the Ontario Heritage Act for the maintenance and repair of those heritage buildings. If these bylaw provisions were enacted by council, orders then could be issued with respect to the heritage buildings and could include those specific standards related to heritage. So our strategy to address vacant buildings in the city included the proactive enforcement of the existing regulations and Remember that I stated previously that we actually defined residential as something where people lived, so it was a dwelling. So in fact, we didn't have uh, a strong enough provision for the specific vacant buildings that we needed. But we moved ahead anyway um, and applied the existing regulations to the vacant buildings. As I mentioned, we had two officers dedicated full-time all of last summer issuing orders against these buildings. So some of the mechanisms that we applied when we proactively enforced this program included uh, the property standards bylaw, which uh, requires that the exterior and interior of any of the lands that are around the building and the building itself be maintained at a minimum standard. The, our board up bylaw in the City of Ottawa had been amended several years previously to state that the board up material must uh, be harmonious with the rest of the building. Unfortunately, 
uh, that was not being applied. So there were many boarded up buildings that had the, you know, you see the pieces of plywood very obviously boarded up. So we re revisited all of those buildings. We made them change it. We made them paint it so that it, it was in harmony with the rest of the, of the building. So not as noticeable, didn't stand out nearly as much. Uh, the property maintenance bylaws, I stated, has to do with the, mostly the exterior of the building, so the grass, any debris on the property, anything like that, property maintenance. And the good thing about property maintenance is the work can be done a lot faster. So under property standards, we not, must give the, the owner of the property a minimum of 14 days to appeal the order and, a, and five days on top of that for delivery of the order. So we're looking at a minimum of 19 days before we can expect that the work is going to be done. Under our property maintenance bylaw, it can be a lot quicker. So for long grass, for instance, we'll give the property owner three to five days to cut the grass. Or if it's a lot of debris on the property, how much do you need? We'll give you five days to get that cleaned up. So it's a faster mechanism to get the outside of the buildings cleaned up. We also have a graffiti management bylaw in the City of Ottawa. Um, many, as you probably know, many vacant buildings uh, are uh, destinations for graffiti tra taggers. So we were very proactive in, in ensuring that the graffiti markings on any of the buildings were removed as quickly as possible. Once again, that's a very quick pro process, so we can get those, those tags removed quickly. As well, we had to apply the signs by law. So to give you an example of what was happening, we have uh, one particular building that the chief building official is dealing with and the downtown core, it's an old school, you've probably read about it in the paper, and they have hoarding up around the building, uh, so because it's, in, it's a little bit dangerous right now, we think. Um, and the owner of the property was renting out the space on the hoarding for people to put up postering. So they were using it as a commercial enterprise to get money for the signs that were being put on the hoarding. So we put a stop to that quite quickly. Um, as of the fall of 2013, um, more than 14 vacant buildings had been demolished. So very few of those were heritage, they were just derelict, vacant buildings that were falling down anyway and were an eyesore. We had issued over 50 property standards orders and we had issued over 40 notices uh, for board up. So the two officers were extremely busy last summer. So in preparation for going forward in September, we did extensive consultation. So we met with individuals and organizations who were known to have an interest in the subject matter, including Heritage Ottawa. Um, we went through the draft proposals um, and notified when these would be considered by committee so that they could go and speak. Staff also met with interested parties as they requested that we do so. And at this point, we were working very closely with Sally and her colleagues and also with our chief building official to make sure that we had, we were on track with everything that we needed to put in the bylaw. We also followed up and met with the Built Heritage Subcommittee with an overview and draft proposal um, as it would relate specifically to the heritage properties. We met with them in September of 2013. In general, we certainly had uh, great support for our, our, our approach and our proposals. Um, we had some naysayers, but very few. Uh, any of the comments we received, we incorporated into the report. Um, and uh, we were absolutely sure that we had all the legal authority we needed to introduce these new regulations and also that they could be enforced. Um, we take a very strong view in bylaw services that don't put something in place that cannot be enforced. It just, builds, uh, it just builds hope that something's going to happen. So we always make sure when we put something in place that number one, it is enforceable legally, and number two, that we have the necessary resources to respond to that issue. So just to let you know, over the last year or so, we've been pushing back on several departments that want to introduce other kinds of bylaws. We're saying we don't have the resources. But in this case, we were already doing this work it was just giving us more tools to be able to do it properly. So the new property standards bylaw, including the heritage component of it, was approved by our city council and became effective on January the 1st of 2014. So it's relatively new. Uh, also, as you're aware, even here, you know that our winters are very severe. 
So an often, often, often we have uh, situations where we will notice something amiss in January, but it might involve doing paint work or exterior work of some kind, and it reasonably cannot be done in the winter months. So we will, when we issue the orders, we always make it uh, the compliance date sometime into the spring so the work can be done. We don't stop doing our job, we just make the compliance date a little longer. As part of our review, staff recommended that a separate section or part related specifically to heritage par, uh, properties uh, to specifically outline the requirements to ensure that the maintenance of heritage features be incorporated into the property standards bylaw. In addition to the incorporation of the required definitions from the Ontario Heritage Act, the requirements would include a minimum standard for the preservation and protection of heritage attributes the repair of heritage attributes, and the protection of the building itself. Uh, the first recommendation was to include several def definitions into the bylaw from the Ontario Heritage Act. So we added that to the property standards bylaw, and those include such definitions as heritage at attributes, part four, part five of heritage, heritage properties. So, that's how thick our new bylaw is now. Because we actually introduced a whole section on vacant properties and a whole section on heritage properties. And it's all broken out. It's very easy for both the public to understand and for the enforcement officers to be able to find the necessary sections. Luckily, our legal services branch worked also worked very closely with us on, the, on this new bylaw. So minimum standards were ad added to the bylaw which requires that the owner or occupant of a Part 4 heritage property or a Part 5 heritage property uh, be required to maintain, preserve, protect the heritage attributes of the building or structure and to maintain the property and the components of the property that hold up, support and protect those heritage attributes. We also added to the bylaw the requirement for the repair of heritage attributes, where they can be repaired. Where they cannot be repaired, the owner is required to replace those attributes using the same type of material as the original or an alternative that replicates the distinctive features and appearance of the original material. So once again, our heritage planners would be involved in determining how exactly that would be done. Owners of vacant Part 4 and Part 5 heritage properties are now required under the bylaw to protect the building and property by effectively preventing the entrance into it of all animals and unauthorized persons, and by closing and securing openings to the building with boarding. So our board up bylaw then, then applies. It must be done in a material that's, that blends in with the rest of the building, but it must be boarded up at all times so that nothing or nobody can get inside of it. We used to do that, require that for safety purposes so people would not get inside into danger. Now we're doing it for that reason, but also to try and preserve the, in, the b building as well as we can. The requirement in the bylaw specifically outline, uh, the, sorry, the requirements in the bylaw specifically outline standards of boarding um, that not only minimize dam damage to the heritage attributes of the property, but they also minimize those visu the visual uh, appearance of the building itself. So, as mentioned earlier, the new bylaw came into effect on January the 1st, 2014. We're in the very early stages of, of uh, doing this work, although we've made significant progress. I'll show you. They always say, um, you need to measure what you're doing. So from the beginning, we created a chart. Every property that we're dealing with, we divided it into just vacant buildings and the second half of it is vacant heritage properties. We have fo before photos and when the work is done, we include after photos. And in the columns, we keep track of where it is in the process. So has the owner applied for a demolition permit? Has the owner met with Sally and the heritage uh, planners to speak to redeveloping that property? So about once a month, we update this chart. 
Um, and we stay on top of it because every once in a while we get a phone call from the mayor's office. Uh, the mayor would like to meet with you tomorrow to get an update on the vacant property uh, list. So we make sure that we are keeping it up to date at all times. So here's just two examples of buildings in the city of Ottawa that have been allowed to deteriorate uh, to the point probably of demolition just by neglect of the owner. So as our chief building official said, we're not sure how much can be saved of some of these buildings, but what we're committing to is that this will not happen going forward. So I wanted to bring this one to your attention because this is a situation where uh, the heritage planners would not take no for an answer on this. When we passed our bylaw, we put in a definition of a vacant building and uh, the vacant building definition excludes agricultural buildings. So uh, we had a, a call from uh, a colleague of um, Sally's saying we need to deal with this, this barn out in the far west end of the city of Ottawa. And in bylaw, we're reading the definition said it doesn't apply to, to uh, agricultural lands, but they won't be denied. So they kept going back and forth and I have the string of emails and basically we involved legal services and then it turned out in the section related to heritage and this is designated as a heritage uh, barn, uh, it does say that they have to be repaired. So that section under heritage trumped the definition of what a vacant property was. So we have issued a very extensive order recently uh, to the owner of this barn. But this is a situation I have to point out where we're all working together on this. Uh, we're trying to make sure that we do it right or just learning how to do this right and having Sally and her colleagues working with us on it and also our legal services branch has been very, very helpful. And as it turned out, I opened up the Ottawa Citizen this week and there in fact was a, an article about this very barn. And this is a woman who used to live there in the house and she was lamenting the fact that she saw this barn, she, she was worried it was going to fall apart because the land has been bought by a developer who will be building a subdivision here eventually. And I, all I could think when I read the article is no, it's not going to fall down. We've already issued the order. We're going to deal with it. So I thought that was uh, interesting as I was coming here to speak today that this one was actually in the paper this week. The house itself is being well maintained, but the, as you can see, the barn is uh, starting to fall apart. So here's an example of how we were able to all work together to revitalize a property, a heritage property, or a property that's in a heritage area. Um, so they were permitted to increase the density of this building and by, by doing so at the same time had to um, repair, do the repairs to the building uh, that were in uh, compliance with the Heritage Act. And as you can see, we feel that they've done a very good job on that. A lot of meetings, a lot of consultation, but it can be done and they've already increased the value of that property I would argue. So rather than do questions now, I'll let Sally do her piece and then we'll be open for questions at the end. Thank you, Linda. Um, Linda's given us some background um, on how the city came to change um, the property standards bylaw um, and incorporate um, the powers in the act to have heritage sections and property standards bylaws. And um, and again, she I'd just like to reiterate that it was very much it's very much a, a, a team effort and um, the the understanding of bylaw and their comprehension of the of the the heritage issues helped um, really help this uh, 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 new bylaw come about. Um, but again, uh, for any 
you know, municipality, I'd like to, you know, the, if there are, you know, a, a bylaws are not a magic bullet, as, as Linda quoted our chief building uh, official as saying, that you know, all the bylaws in the world and all the goodwill and the mayor being on side still doesn't, can never get around the fact that there are people who have neglected their buildings and, uh, and it's often a challenge to, uh, to um, get, get them repaired. Um, before, I, before I go into my section, I thought that I would uh, I outline, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, the Heritage, um, pro uh, a little bit about the Heritage Program in Ottawa. We have um, about 300 Part 4 designated buildings. These are just a, a, a sampling, uh, and designated buildings and properties, uh, houses, public buildings, city-owned buildings. So we try to lead by example in our city-owned buildings, which is, uh, you see the old courthouse, which is Arts Court. I included the house on the upper left because that building um, uh, burnt uh, uh, two years ago. The fire, uh, the roof caught on fire, and uh, again, uh, uh, just uh, bylaw. Pro you know, everybody was there because when there's a major fire, you have to make sure that uh, you know, you know, to take the next steps. And uh, this house is being uh, rebuilt eg exactly the same, um, except not with a cedar roof because that's what burnt. But um, uh, Again, and it was you know various departments at the city and the insurance industry. For those of you who despair of the insurance industry not being sympathetic, the insurance adjuster for this was on site right from the start, and we got the exact um, exact uh, replica restoration of of the building that burnt. Um, that's just kind of an aside because it's an issue that everybody is interested in. We also have 18 heritage conservation districts in the city of Ottawa. Um, uh, that down, there's a downtown on Spark Street, on Bank Street. There's uh, two Lower Town where num a number of our vacant building and derelict buildings are. Uh, five in Sandy Hill, the former village of Rockcliffe Park. So we have a, a big, uh, a big, big uh, with thousands of buildings that are protected under either Part 4 or Part 5 of the, of the Heritage Act that we deal with every day. Um, there are challenges. Um, uh, and now that we do have these, uh, the stronger bylaw and political will from the mayor's office, uh, despite this, there are still you know severely neglected buildings. And again, all the bylaws in in the world, uh, it, you know, uh, are only uh, if 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 people won't comply and they have to be taken to court, it takes longer to accomplish things. Um, uh, and because our bylaw has only been in effect since January 1st, a lot of what I'm going to, the rest of what I'm going to talk about today is, you know, what we have done without it to um, to try to save some, you know, save some buildings and their heritage attributes. And I think the the message is is that if we could accomplish some of what we have accomplished without this bylaw and without using the sections of the Ontario Heritage Act that give municipalities the right to have have um, property standards related to heritage, um, then I guess only imagine that now we have have those um, clauses in the property standards bylaw regarding neglected and vacant buildings, um, what we can do. So, of course, the one that's in the news all the time um, is... Uh, this is one of our big challenges, and I'm uh, I, I'm citing this because um, uh, it, well, it, it has been in the news, and it's a very interesting case. And I know I hope that anybody doesn't have to deal with a building like this. Um, but again, hypothetically, what could we do if some of the damage hadn't been done? So this this is Our Lady School. Um, uh, Linda mentioned it with regard to the to the. Uh, billboards that uh, once they they were ordered to um, secure the building because of its threats to public safety and so and then of course once you had it secured or surrounded by um, by uh, a fence you could then put things on the fence so this is what you uh, see here is there the 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 bill the the use of the the fence that, that they had to do by order of the city then they then they advertised on it um, this building was, has been vacant since the 1970s, so a long, long time. Um, during my time at the City of Ottawa, and I started in 1990, I realize I can't count, it's not 22 years, it's 24 years since I've worked there, there have been many, many, or at least four redevelopment proposals for this building. And there have been innumerable property standards um, 
orders um, issued on it. Uh, and one of the things that there was a, a lot of, this is interesting, a, a lot of controversy about was the, the property owner took, a, took the cornice off without telling anybody. And, and uh, so that's why you see that there's some uh, damage around, uh, I don't know whether I have an arrow. Oh yeah, anyway. It had a very deep cornice, as was typical of, of school buildings, and it was removed. And again, um, with the new bylaw, that, that would have been an attribute, so we could have, uh, you know, if it was in bad shape, we would have ordered its repair, um, or, uh, or if it had been removed, it, uh, its uh, reinstatement. So, uh, so what, after many years in September, uh, th there, be, th there was, litigation going on it was in the courts and I think to keep out of the courts the building owner um, signed a, a legal agreement in which we the city required or allowed the re, uh, the demolition of uh, two of the walls of the building um, and required that the other two be stabilized and that uh, the building be um, uh, made good for the winter so it didn't have to have hoardings around it for the winter etc uh, etc et and uh, since that was went to committee and council was passed the owners were there there was all um, uh, and it was going to be photo documented. It was all ready to go, and since then, nothing has happened. So we are back in the courts again. And I guess this is just the cautionary tale: is that you, we have done everything to retain this building as part of the Lower Town, as part of the city's heritage fabric. It tells the story of Catholic English education in in Lower Town. It's a good example of a school type, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, nothing has happened. And all and there are people. People who have only practically been working on this building for years and um, and nothing has happened and uh, the the developer comes in uh, the owner comes in for pre-consultation with a replacement building uh, retaining walls or not retaining walls etc and we encourage them to come back to preserve its attributes and nothing happens and again uh, uh, it's incredibly difficult. So uh, another one, uh, similar situation, the two buildings um, on, the, on, the, on your left are, have been derelict for years. They're now better boarded up as a result of the new, of the new bylaw. Um, they, uh, so they look tidier, but they're still vacant. And uh, actually, for any municipalities who are thinking about um, these bylaws, one of the questions that we discussed a lot and we did research across the country was um, heating them, whether we would require that buildings be heated um, uh, as a, to be further ensure that their, their preservation as when they're vacant. And ultimately, the decision, we made the decision um, not to go ahead with requiring the heating of buildings uh, because uh, for a number of reasons, um, one was how do you inspect as you know as it has to be realistic how do you inspect a building to see whether it's heated like because you can't actually go in you know is it frosted window and so that the whole enforcement issue of that was tricky and um, also uh, uh, I talked to people in Winnipeg too and various places and you know if it's heated then if the heat you know, if the heat goes and it's uh, uh, radiators, then the radiators burst. And in the end, we decided that it would be more realistic to require a drained system and an unheated building than risk water damage through um, broken pipes. So uh, that's what that's that's why we made that decision. It was a very hard decision, and I don't think every everybody agreed with it. I think Heritage Ottawa wanted the, um, buildings heated, but. In the end, uh, that was the decision. So, Alinda again went over what um, the what the uh, the standards for occu you know, occupied buildings and what we can require, etc. So, I won't um, I won't do that again. In ter terms of if anybody's interested in the sections of the Act, it's 35.3 and 34 or 45.1 are um, talk are the sections of the Act that talk about minimum standards for heritage buildings and protection of attributes. And I think the important thing in our in the bylaw, as Linda mentioned, is that we use the, the language is consistent. The language of the bylaw is the language of the Heritage Act, so there's no question about what you're talking about. Um, now I'm coming to the part that everyone likes, the fancy pictures. But um, uh, 
I'm, I've chosen an example. Obviously, we've only had the, the bylaws since January 1st. So this is kind of a, if we had had the bylaw, we could have done this. And, um, and, uh, and we did it anyway through the hard work of, of property standards and my um, predecessor, Stuart Lazier, that this building was saved, um, but it took a long time. And I think the hope is that now that there is a political will and a stronger bylaw regime and the policies in the Heritage Act, which weren't in the Heritage Act until 2005, that all of this is coming together, that these 20 year battles to save one building that we've all gone through in our communities uh, can be much shorter. Um, certainly the turnaround and, and enforcement uh, in the city is oh God, that Linda described to you is amazing. It's quick, it's quick and uh, things are secured. And so um, that's the hope. So the, I'm gonna be looking at, um, I realize I have my uh, slides in the wrong order. This was a, 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 18, a part four designated building built in the, 18, in the 1880s, wooden, it's, a part four building, but it's also in a heritage district on a heritage street, um, designated street in um, in Sandy Hill. Um, and uh, I will go to its picture. So, what happened? Did it not go ahead? Oh, there. So this um, so this is the the, the building. It's, your, it's distinguishing features, as you can see, are. Um, a, a, a tower, the, the round arch window, mansard roof, wood siding. This picture is from the 70s. It was already derelict in the 70s. And I have to say that the whole time it was derelict, it was occupied. And that is another issue that um, is always under, you know, is always at the back of any of some of these buildings is that um, the, the person who lived here, she not only <laughs> property standards, but social services were involved and et cetera, et cetera. So you have to handle these, the, the issues that arise from people who are living in these buildings and with some sensitivity. So there's a, a, a bunch of stuff go going on. And, um, and I, there were, you know, again, wards of the, you know, uh, you know, powers of attorney, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a, another whole thing that has to be dealt with very sensitively because someone was living here. So um, as you can see, it was in a bad shape then in the 70s and then um, worse uh, into the 80s and 90s. It, it was a long, long process. So um, eventually uh, the property was put on the market. So then there was concerns that someone would um, buy it and you know apply to tear it down under the Ontario Heritage Act using the example or using the case well, it's in such bad shape I cannot I cannot retain this building um, so so that was then another concern first there was a concern when it was occupied um, and falling to pieces and the city did go in and do repairs over the years and put them on the tax bill because that is a power that that we had um, so it was trying to keep minimal the minimal standards um, so uh, it was it, so at a certain it was eventually uh, put on put on the market and at this point a lot of the property standards orders had been enacted and the building was in better shape and uh, had been painted and, and one of the things that's interesting about it is that um, if you it's hard to see but uh, the the cladding on the tower is um, chevron shaped it's not uh, so it's it, it pointed so that you know that was one of the things we wanted to save. So um, so then there was some basic stabilization that went on, and this is at that stage. But um, the property owner who did that basic stabilization it was, is a contractor who does a little bit um, of uh, of development on, on the side. So um, he he had it like this for a couple of years, and then um, there was an application under the Ontario Heritage Act. Uh, with, with uh, so for an alteration of a part four designated building um, uh, that involved restoration. And this, again, if you take this to the current regime, these, he was you know, doing what we would have asked him, which is repairing the attributes, the chevron cladding, um, the windows, um, uh, the foundations, etc. cetera. So that, that is something we could now do in, now by order. Uh, order him, to, order him or the previous owner to do that. But it was being done anyway through persistence, basically. Uh, so the alteration was 
to um, reclad where necessary, um, to build a, a, an intervention, a new can canopy over the front door. You see the front door now, it has a, a, round, a round arch and a transom. And, um, and then uh, he wanted to put copper roofing on, these, uh, on the roofs of, the, of this bay. So there is some of this is after the new owner uh, um, had bought it. Again, uh, restoration of the cedar roof, um, a lot of tidying up. So then, once it was sound, um, that gave him time then to do an as I say to do an application under the Ontario Heritage Act. So here is um, the site plan that he he submitted. So you see that. Um, this is the historic building, and he was adding a large, uh, large addition to the rear and converting it into, um, a, 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 I think, a four-unit, um, four-unit house. So this also ran into an issue that's um, been running rampant through the city of Ottawa, which is uh, our our zoning bylaw has just been changed, but converted dwellings. Um, uh, and there were a lot of dwellings, be houses being converted into very small apartments for university students at the University of Ottawa because the University of Ottawa has increased by 10,000 students without adding any residences. So this also then became a neighborhood issue because it was a conversion. And people, although they had complained for decades about the condition of the house, once it was saved, the fact that it was going to be not a single family dwelling but have a number of units then caused another reason for the neighborhood to complain. Anyway, so that is the site plan. Um, actually, interestingly, the, the example that, um, that Linda just showed you of the house on Bolton Street, same architect. So you know, it's good to, good to have uh, architects who are willing to work with these buildings. Again, that doesn't show up very well. That's just his drawings of the front facade. Now, this project now is almost finished. So there it is under construction. You can see by the hydrometers, it is not a single family dwelling. And, um, you know, again, from a heritage perspective, we just wanted the building sound, put back together, all of that work over over 20 years to finally have a reward. Um, so, though I would have put the hydrometers a little farther back, but sometimes these things get away from you. So here he has, again, you saw the doorway before, uh, the little canopy because uh, uh, just to, and, uh, to afford some protection from the weather. Uh, there's the restored tower, um, wooden windows, the roof. Again, he put the roof on a couple of years ago because you can see it's already started to uh, silver out a little bit. There's the front door with the tower. Um, so the addition is is uh, uh, this. This is not as long as it should be. This uh, window, the window in this little addition to the rear. That's that's the original part of the building. It goes back from there. The addition. And there's another view um, towards the addition. Again, as I say, this ha happened in a different policy regime, but I would you know, hope that, again, the, the, the features of this house are something that we could have worked to, um, to uh, have fixed up pri you know, faster if we'd had the new policy regime. So um, that's that. Uh, uh, again, if uh, there are any, again, we're very new with the bylaw. You know, we, we understand it. We've worked, uh, certainly Linda's team has worked hard on it. I know more about property standards than I did before, which is good. Um, so if there's any questions about what we've been doing, and uh, I'd be happy, we, we, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. In the back there. Oh. Um, uh, well, that is a problem that we're all facing is that, you know, that many bylaws were written for decades without the list of heritage attributes that we now include. Um, so I, um, because we work so well together, I mean, again, I think I showed you the, the, uh, the 
statement of reason for the Samarit House, it had no attributes. So we um, interpret that uh, as if it were, if it had attributes listed. Um, I think Linda has the definition. I can read it. I think it's very. Yes, I, actually, I brought one too, but I. Um, it's in relation to real property and to the buildings on the real property, an attribute of the b property, building, or structure that contributes to its cultural heritage value or interest, and that is defined or described. And then it goes through in a bylaw designating in a minister's order. Um, uh, in supporting documentation required for bylaw, so if it's somewhere mentioned the square tower, but it's not actually in the statement, um, include uh, and the uh, and then it also just says part E is the element features or building components, including blah blah blah, that that um, support or protect the heritage values and attributes, and without which the heritage values may be at risk. So it's not only linked to the attributes that are listed in a by, in a designation bylaw there that that section e of the definition in the property standards bylaw gives us the leeway to say these are attributes so that's been very helpful yes most of the problems uh, occur in derelict houses and things and buildings uh, are from water damage is there something that says the owner has to uh, protect the roofing, uh, you know, it, if the roof was protected, the, the walls would uh, last a little bit longer and the roof wouldn't cave in, stuff like that. I'll defer to Linda on that because she's got those um, details. Absolutely, so when we're looking at a vacant building, if the roof, if the property standards officer looks at the roof and the shingles are deteriorating, we issue an order to replace the roof. So absolutely, that this is the new, our new bylaw. So we now have the power to do that. We had a little bit of a learning curve for the officers, uh, quite honestly, and I used to, the two best ones, our, our two best officers, very knowledgeable, long years at the job. And we had a property that was in pretty bad shape. And I said, okay, Derek, I need you to go out and you need to issue orders for A, B, C, D, E. And he said, but it's, it's vacant. Like, why would we make them do all that work? I said, that's the whole point. Because we want, what we're trying to do, I don't want to use the word force, but what we're trying to do is get the attention of an owner of a vacant property to say, either redevelop it, go through the necessary steps, pay for the permits to redevelop the property, or B, you're going to have to do a lot of work on this building. And in, in a lot of cases, they don't want to do all the work because they know that they're going to be redeveloping in three years or four years or five years. We don't have three years to wait. We've either got to do the work now or move ahead here. So now that the officers understand the orders have become longer, um, we've, only had, we've only had two appeals, 50 orders, over 50 orders, two appeals both by that owner that I mentioned that owns all the properties in Lower Town. Um, one of them, um, he just wanted more time because he was redeveloping and he actually has done it. I think that might be the Bolton one yeah. actually the, oh, that I showed you. Owners, but yeah. Right, changed owners, but he, the other one, um, there's, I don't know if a lot of you do know Ottawa, so when you drive along King Edward, there's a number of row houses there. Um, and this particular gentleman has bought a lot of those row houses. Uh, the uh, balconies um, were, and the porches, so there were balconies in the second story with porches, were starting to deteriorate. So we ordered them to repair them. Um, the owner came back and said, can I just remove them? We checked with Sally's group. They said, yes, that's not part of the heritage attributes on it. So they did, but what they did was leave big holes in the brick where they took it down. So now we've issued an order that they've got to fix the, the brick cladding and do it with brick. You can't just put pieces of card or uh, plywood over it. And they have appealed that. So this is actually our first true appeal of something under the new bylaw where we've been more specific about how they have to do the work. So even the officer said the other day, this is going to be an interesting one. So we'll see how we do. But um, so far only two appeals out of all those orders. 
And I'd, I'd like to add something that happened also before this regime, which I think other municipal was a very good thing, is that pre, um, many years ago, if a building was declared to be in terrible shape, then there would be an, an, an order issued to demolish. And this was uh, the, the two white buildings. This was in, involved with that. And there, are, and there was an argument that um, if it was for health and safety, uh, then uh, if it were a designated building, it didn't have to go through the Ontario Heritage Act application to demolish under the Act. And, uh, and so, so there was the perception that if your building was, if your heritage building was in bad enough shape, you didn't need a permit under the Act. And um, the, the city came back with a protocol and saying, yes, you do need a permit under the Act. That just issue, that even if it's an issue, if, if it's not an issue to repair, but it's an issue to demolish, it's, it, that your, your demolition permit cannot be issued until you actually also have one under the Ontario Heritage Act. So that's why we have managed to um, to keep a number of buildings. Those white ones um, that I showed you, there was a permit to demolish issued without it going to council and that was um, in error. Again, we're all communicating better. And that um, permit was um, rescinded and those buildings are, st are still standing. And I, there have been meetings about their potential redevelopment with, um, with uh, infill to the rear. So um, that, that's a, that was one of our first steps and that was quite a long time ago and I would recommend that everybody do that. Make sure that, that, um, the, that, you, that if there's a, a, an order to demolish because of fire damage or whatever that it, to make sure that it goes through the heritage process also. Um, I, in terms of roofs, uh, there was a building that burnt in Stittsville earlier this fall and the first thing we did was or, uh, order a, a temporary roof just while the whole issue was being looked at and in the end the building was beyond saving but um, our chief building official had wanted it protected and not having water infiltration to make sure um, bef while we did the analysis to see whether or not it could be saved so that, that, that's there. Um, uh, the, uh, you. <laughs> Are you getting any negative uh, public feedback for your proactive enforcement? Um, in other words, a lot of your bylaws you have no proactive enforcement. This particular one you do, is it causing confusion? Is there negative public input? Um, I don't know how many of you know our mayor, Mayor Jim Watson, but he has come out so leading the charge on this issue so strongly and has done an ama he's an amazing communicator. He's done an extremely good job with the media. He's really the champion of this project, I would say, right? Um, if there's a lot of people, if there are people who disagree with our approach, they're not saying so. Um, he has publicly named the individual who owns all the properties in the downtown core. He has stood in front of one of his buildings and had interviews with the media about how disgusting and disgraceful the buildings are and named the owner. Um, quite honestly, a lot of the uh, people that we're dealing with with vacant properties outside of heritage areas um, have been very agreeable and very quick to do the work. And Quinn have always said to us, almost every time, I am going to be redeveloping it, I just don't have everything, my funds together yet or my approvals, so tell me what I have to do. So they have been doing it. But I have to say a lot of the reticence to complain is probably because people are a little like, whoa, whoa, I just don't, you know, this is something that the city is serious about and we're moving forward on it and um, we've had a lot of positive feedback, a lot of positive feedback. Uh, the gentleman right at 12 o'clock from me. Uh, did you consider uh, the need for alarming vacant buildings? Alarming. Uh, oh, no, that's no, no. No. A lot of times the hydro, I think the hydro's uh, cut off in most of them, eh? I, I guess, uh, you know, it's great to board up the building, but I've been to so many sites where the, the boarding has been removed, entrance has been gained, and sometimes buildings have been burnt simply because they can easily remove the hoarding or board. Yeah, and, and certainly that, that, 
that issue has been um, addressed by Linda and her team with you know uh, more regular inspection and and a, a, a comprehensive list of every building that is vacant so um, to to reduce that risk but who I, you know. if, if, if they could be alarmed it would be so much better I think in terms of protecting them. Like Sally mentioned about the heat, it's interesting because our chief building official, when we talked about um, this uh, new bylaw, we started, we've had discussions about it for about 10 years. Um, and it was always assumed that we were, gonna re we were going to require heat. Always assumed. And, and our chief building official was adamant that, no, 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 there should be heat inside. So the first time that we met with Sally and her colleagues, and they went, well, you know, Maybe it doesn't need to be, and we went through everything, and I was kind of shocked. I was like, oh, one of the issues that Sally raised, which I think it's really important to understand, is that in a lot of cases, putting many of these vacant properties, because they've been allowed to be sitting there for so long, the owner has taken out everything out of the inside that has value. So they've taken out all the copper, all the, any metal, the heat, heat ducts, anything like that have been removed. It's just a shell. So as Sally said, if they go in with a propane heater into these buildings that where the wood is like kindling, we could have a lot more fires. So if we're, we're hoping to preserve them, we don't want them burning to the ground. So there, there was weighing that. But certainly if, if you felt in your municipality that it would be important to have an alarm system on them, you can put it in the bylaw that it's required. I mean, it's up to council to decide is that, is that realistic or not. Um, and, and certainly the, the whole propane thing is that we lost a very, very important stone building in the early 90s uh, uh, because it was, it was designated, it was being incorporated, it was having townhouses built around it, it was a, the kind of a development that we like, and it had a propane furnace in it and it burnt to the ground one January night because of the propane furnace. So that has made me paranoid. <laughs> uh, you here, and then, and then Andrew, okay? Uh, does your bylaw incorporate anything to do with the insurance of the building? Does it tie into the insurance for...? No. No, we don't speak to insurance. There's nothing to do with that. And in the, when you had issued the order for the temporary roofing, who was responsible for paying for that? The owner? The owner is always responsible. Even though the fire was...? Well, eventually I suppose they could make a claim through insurance. But the building code act under the property standard sections, the owner of a property is always responsible for the cost of the work being done. So just it, one of the concerns that we've had in the past for property standards, the other power that we have is we, if somebody doesn't comply with an order, we can take them to court for failing to comply with the order, which starts a lengthy process. The other thing we can do is do the work. We can hire people, like they did, I think Sweetland, that's yep. what we did. We hired somebody to do the work, then you add it to the tax roll. So the tax collector in the city of Ottawa is our friend as well. So we have to call them and say, are there already tax arrears? Are there any liens against this property? Because we're looking to put it, you know, $50,000 worth of work on the tax bill. Um, we are cautious about going in to do the work when it's a very large bill. That's not to say we won't do it. But as much as possible, we try to avoid doing it if it's going to be a large bill. But the cost is always the responsibility of the property owner. So whether they pay it directly or it gets put on their tax bill and it's a lien against the property event that, that stays there as long as that person owns the property. Andrew? Just an observation, the championing of this these bylaws by your mayor is great, but it, it seems like it could be a double-edged sword. Like on the one hand, it sends a clear message to the property owners that the political will is there on council. But there was a specific incident in Kingston where there was a property standards order issued against CN, the railway company, which was challenged by them. And everybody thought initially that the challenge was gonna be on the basis of jurisdiction because it's federally regulated and the, 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 the provincial legislation couldn't be applied to it, but that in fact wasn't the case. The jurisdiction wasn't the problem. What ended up happening was that um, the final decision was to quash the property standards order because it was seen as being from council, that council had effectively directed the chief building official uh, to make this property standards order, uh, which was in excess of its authority under the Building Code Act. The council couldn't 
give direction to the building official in this matter. So have you made sure that there's a real like wall, but a division between the responsibilities of the building official and people reporting to the building official under the Building Code Act and the role of council uh, that you don't have a situation where somebody could say, oh, well, it's, it's the mayor who's telling the chief building official to make this order. That's where legal services helps us a lot. Um, once, once our council has approved this bylaw, enacted the bylaw, for them to be involved on a day-to-day -day basis in the enforcement of the bylaw is a conflict, as, as you pointed out. Our council is very, very much aware of that. Uh, they're, uh, before they even start their, their tenure, uh, they go through a lot of instruction by our, our city uh, clerk, who's also the head of our city legal department, and it's explained to them to our counselors. I mean, I, I oversee parking tickets as well. So you can imagine, um, if, if it wasn't clearly explained to them what their role is, uh, how many calls I'd be getting. In fact, in my former job in my smaller municipality, I got a lot of those calls. Uh, so it just goes from parking tickets to property standards orders. It's not appropriate. Now, the mayor or a ward counselor may meet with us to discuss our next steps and they may make it clear what they would like our next steps to be um, and show support for a certain step that they'd like to see happen. But it's ultimately up to us about in you know consultation with uh, legal, uh, with heritage, with our chief building official, do we do this or don't we do it? Um, so in the case of the school, I'll give you just as an example, um, as, as Sally's explained, um, an agreement was reached, all parties signed it, and the owner has done nothing. In fact, it's gone through another winter, deteriorated even further. So the mayor is like, and the ward councilor is like, what's happening? So our chief building official explained what is happening and he said, all they said was, what are the next legal steps we need to take? And the solicitor was there and said, this is what it is. And, and they said, be great if that happened. Um, it, having, they don't direct what, what we do, but having their support for something as controversial, this could have been extremely controversial. Uh, this is not, uh, this is a big switch for property owners. In that particular, that one individual, um, they could have made our life a living hell. Uh, but having that, um, um, having that support by our council, by our heritage committee, I, um, the uh, chair of our heritage committee is uh, Jan Harder, who is known for her outspoken attitude and an approach to life, and she's totally behind us 100% as well. So they don't, I, I hear what you're saying, and that's interesting, and, and by the way, on federal, um, federal properties, as you can imagine in the city of Ottawa, just imagine how many federal properties there are. Uh, recently, just this week, um, we have met uh, with um, representatives from the Iraqi government about a property that they own in Rockcliffe Park that is in a designated heritage area that has been vacant since 19, since the 1970s, I think. Since the first um, The Iraqi government, now here's what we found out uh, when we went there, because we, what we're asking is, because it's considered uh, embassy property, um, so we're kind of saying, can you do a little, we need some work done here, like we need this stuff. And they were very amenable and agreeable. But here's what we heard. Uh, they wanted to cr have their embassy there. That's what they want. They wanted to use the structure and expand it and, and create an embassy. Uh, the, it. Oh, did they want to tear it down? Well, anyway, okay. Of, many so, things. <laughs> so, the, um, so the neighbors are, they don't want this to happen. So that's fine. They just walked away from it and they have built, uh, bought another property close by and they're spending 22 million a shocking, amount, a of shocking money. amount of money to construct their embassy. So this property is surplus to need, but they were very clear, we're not getting rid of it. No, 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 we're hanging on to it. So we're kind of in a uh, catch-22. We try to work with them. Uh, there's a lot of embassies. If it's an active embassy, we actually have absolutely no jurisdiction. Uh, but we work through the department, uh, one of the federal departments, uh, external affairs, I believe, or, or I can't, yeah. 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 we work through one of the, the uh, federal um, departments to try and get voluntary compliance. Luckily, for the most part, most of the embassy properties are not only well-maintained, but 
gorgeous, expensive property. So, anyway. But but one thing, Andrew, also is that you know again, you know, the mayor can't be telling people to order. You know, your point is well taken. But council sets the policy, and it was the council's will to you know to direct staff to do this. And so there is always you know. That, that balance that uh, this you know we are enacting the will of council when we pass these new bylaws as long as it's a policy and not a property specific kind yeah, of direction yeah. then yes yeah. same yeah. as a specific parking ticket yeah. same <laughs> concept. exactly I, I'm, I'm amused that you had councillors calling you about parking tickets not in Ottawa but somewhere else <laughs> <laughs> a anything else yes in the front here when you first started uh, talking about vacant buildings and changing the bylaw there was something in the in the citizen about uh, vacancy tax credits that if they didn't follow the bylaws that that would be they would not get their tax credit. Yeah. Now, actually, the tax regime is beyond my <laughs> understanding, but before, <laughs> but then you said you know if you have to, if they have to pay it'll go on the tax roll so do they end up getting a bigger vacancy tax credit because now their tax bill is larger yeah one of the things that we looked into just a second i found it i was going through the report and i i'd actually forgotten about some of them when a property is vacant they are able to apply and have the property taxes reduced so one of the tools that we were to look into was, can we get the province to change that policy? So not giving a tax break to somebody because they let the property sit vacant. As it turned out, no, we can't. We couldn't do anything about that. The other thing that we had hoped that we examined was, um, could we use the fire code more extensively? As it turns out, we found out, I believe, that the fire code, we could, there is a little bit more power we have, but it would have to be a commercial building rather than a residential building. So we had about four things that we were looking at. Um, and of course, we always laugh about this. It kept narrowing down to bylaw, bylaw. So it, limiting the property tax reduction, so that was one thing that we looked in. Uh, strengthen the existing bylaw, well, that's what we did end up doing. Um, developing specific standards related to the Ontario Heritage Act, well, we did that. Uh, considered, considering a bylaw similar to that in place in the city of Winnipeg, requiring annual permits for vacant buildings and the payment of associated fees. So the city of Winnipeg had a huge problem with vacant buildings. Um, if every year that your, vac your property is vacant, you have to buy a permit, and every year the permit amount goes up and up and up. So it encourages you. Now the problem with that is there's a lot of staff that are gonna to have to be associated with that program. So I think basically what we said to our council was, let's not go there right now, let's see if the way we wanna do it will work, and it's a tool maybe we can come back to later. Um, and reviewing the feasibility of requiring a safety plan to be in place uh, under the Fire Code Act, um, but that was only for commercial buildings. So we did look at the ta the thing we were trying to do was get the province to take away the benefit of, of reducing their taxes if the property was vacant. Uh, yes? Just in regards to boarding up and, and uh, trying to secure some of these uh, vacant buildings, uh, I've come up against an idea where we're sort of in a catch-22 situation. We're now fighting the ideas of black mold. Um, we had a developer who had a house that was boarded up. He said, well, it's going to cost you $3 million to take the black mold of the house, so we may as well tear it down. Um, actually, we, I had this discussion, so because that, that is a real issue, and we talked about holes, holes being drilled in the windows for... for we we it, saw it. it has, they have to be properly ventilated, and that yeah. was, this was the issue that Sally raised with it. That's why it was so great working together, was this whole concern about mold growing inside. Um, so I think the requirement in the bylaw, I know, I, I don't think I know, that there's a requirement in the bylaw that they have to be properly ventilated. And some of that was like whether or not when you're putting in the, when, you, when the board up order has been issued, you put a stopper in so that the air could get behind the, uh, behind, with, without making it easier to pry off, air could get in. So yeah, that, it, it is in there. Yeah. 
Yes. Did you like that you mentioned uh, painting the board, the boarding on yeah. the windows? So what color, for example, would you do? So it coordinates with the exterior of the house. So what we were getting was people, so if I look at this property on the Don't far fall right. Off. Oh, okay, here I can use that. I'm just worried. I can use that, yeah, I know. I'm going to fall over. Of course I am. Because that's what I do. So if I look at this one, if this became vacant, people would, uh, owners would put, just put a piece of plywood over that window or over those three. Now they have to paint it. So we would be looking for it to coordinate either with the brick or perhaps with this. So it can't just be a piece of cardboard. It has to coordinate. So that when you're, one of the counselors actually wanted us to force them, if they were boarding up a window, to, there's a, a French name for it, to paint a window on the boarded up window. So it looked like a window. Yeah, a trump door. And uh, we kind of went, oh, okay, that's a little much. Um, but it's the whole idea is that when you're driving past the property, it isn't an eyesore, it doesn't jump out at you if it's vacant. Very bad. This doesn't maybe apply to abandoned buildings, but does Ottawa have a uh, uh, tax rebate program to help people with heritage buildings maintain them? No, we have a heritage grant program, a small um, uh, grant program for, in, for property owners, $5,000 on a matching basis. Um, on our list of policies that we wanted to do, one of the, the first thing we wanted to look into was what we've just finished here, and the next thing we're going to look into is a property tax rebate, but we, do not, we don't have one now, we just have the grant program. Property tax rebates are tricky in Ottawa because of grants in lieu of taxes. There's so many buildings that don't pay taxes because they're federally owned that our, uh, there's been problems with our finance, but we don't, but we do have grants. Yes? It seems to me that it was a lot of work to put these standards in place, and I'm just wondering, is this something that has to be done in terms of minimum standards, has to be done municipality by municipality? Um, is there something specific about Ottawa, or is this something that could be handled by regulations under the Heritage Act, for example? Like, if you're designating a property, right, there are criteria under the Act, right, and then you pass a bylaw. What about minimum standards? Why couldn't it be on a province-wide basis? There is, the Act gives you the power to do that. Um, through 35, Andrew will know the numbers, he knows all the numbers, 35.3 and 45.1 or whatever, but the individual municipality has to, to, uh, has, to pa has to put those in force. There's a process under the Act that you have to do it. So at this point, um, you couldn't do it provincially. And then... I'm just wondering whether that's something that should be in the Act. I mean, the province has standards for its own building. But is there something that could be done? Because there's a lot of work for every municipality to go through this process. And demolition by neglect is one of the biggest issues that we deal with. Would it be possible to have a set of regulations that deal with, you know, like plywood and windows and whatever on a province okay. There is, sorry, I, and, and I don't know that much. Here's what I found out at amalgamation when, in 2001, Ottawa amalgamation. And, Shortly, about, about two years after that, we hadn't harmonized our property standards bylaw yet. About two years after that, I got an invoice for a property standards inspection by somebody from the province in the, in the former city of Canada. And I'm like, what the heck is that? So I phoned them and I said, what is this? And they said, well, if a municipality does not have a property standards bylaw, now I don't know if this is still in force, they could get in touch with the province and the province would send an inspector in and do the property standards inspection under the Building Code Act, and then bill back the municipality. Um, so to answer your question about minimum standards, I believe under the Building Code Act, there are minimum standards. Um, it, for smaller, very small municipalities, this having a property standards bylaw, I'm not sure of the value or the frequency of use of it. But for any municipality with, you know, a, a certain threshold of, in, of population, it's a very valuable tool. It, it's intended to, as you probably know, 
um, to ensure that the housing stock of a municipality does not fall to rack and ruin. And that's mostly related to tenants. So um, if you've got a rent, rental properties in, in your community that the property owner just lets fall to nothing, um, this prevents that from happening so that there's still a good housing stock. But, you know, they, I agree with you, for smaller municipalities, it's very difficult. It is difficult to, to, first of all, enact these regulations and then find somebody that's going to enforce it. It costs money, training, all kinds of stuff. And Andrew, and then, or, or is that a sub, uh, you go ahead because it might be supplementary to his question. You, you. What ministry would be responsible for coming in and doing that inspection? So it's the Building Code Act, so it would be um, provincial. Yeah, yes, MMHA, yeah. Municipal yeah. Affairs and Housing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I'm, I'm assuming that's still in place. I would think that the province would, I don't know. Like, I know the fellow that was doing it was retiring. So I was like, oh, thank God, I'm not going to really get more of these bills. But I don't know if somebody came along to replace it. But it is, I mean, again, it's more effective to have, a, you know, a, a, a bylaw in place in a municipality enforced by people who work for that municipality. Yeah. It, it's more effective. But it is problematic with smaller. Andrew? Your point earlier, and it was very well taken, about it's not a good idea to have bylaws on the books that you have no capability to enforce. Yeah. Um, it, it only encourages people to have a, a certain disregard for the law if they know that there's a statute that they can just ignore because they're never going to see an inspector or get an order. Um, I don't know the answer about what the situation is with the province getting involved uh, in doing an inspection. You'd have to check with Municipal Affairs and Housing to see whether or not that still exists. Um, from what I, I mean, what I know of my reading of the uh, Building Code Act, I don't remember seeing any reference to that in legislation, but there may be some uh, other mechanism for it. But uh, um, yeah, I mean, it would be perfectly plausible. Every municipality can have a property standards bylaw under the Building Code Act, and it would be perfectly plausible for municipalities to essentially duplicate the heritage provisions of another municipality and, and just, you know, uh, have their council adopt the exact same wording uh, as you know, the city of Ottawa or one of the other municipalities that has done it, the problem would then be one of enforcement. And it's one thing, you are very fortunate to have the staff and, and, and good staff working for the city of Ottawa to be able to carry out the enforcement. Some municipalities have you know, cut their property standards or bylaw enforcement down to the bone uh, and they simply couldn't enforce it if they had it in place. So then one would have to ask, is it actually helping to have something on paper that has no teeth to it because you don't have the people. Yeah. One, one of the best things about during this bylaw, one of the councillors wanted to um, put um, not being allowed to have old couches on your property as part of property standards. And, and uh, then we, we all, I mean, joked around like, how, how would you define old? Would it be upholstered? What if it was wicker? You know, so again, enforceability is always an issue. It's a, I think a lot of municipalities struggle with that, and smaller ones. Well, it's interesting because I was I was speaking to somebody from the Ministry of Transportation with the province because the municipalities uh, license driving schools, and the province um, under MTO regulations licenses driving instructors as well. And what only in the last three years have we all realized? Wow, there's a benefit to us talking to each other about this and working together on these companies. So I was speaking with her one day and I, I said, well, how exactly do you enforce this? And she said, well, like you, we often pass regulations that we never enforce. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. No, no, not like us. Because we, you know, certainly as long as I'm there, which isn't for very much longer, I, I would fight to the nails for us to bring in anybody. And actually, Smoking in the city parks, I'm going to be honest with you, for many years I fought that, that regulation because I'm like, how are we ever going to enforce that? Like, how are we going to do that? We have Drones. a thousand parks. Drones. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, only when we got to a critical mass that there were so few smokers in the city of Ottawa um, that I thought, okay, we're pretty much going to have compliance 100%. We hire some students in the summer that go and patrol the parks for many things, including smoking. But for many years, I said, 
the weekend in Tulsa, Trenton, or Quinty West as it's now called, jumped on the bandwagon probably almost 10 years ago and put in no smoking in city parks. So I phoned them and I said, how do you enforce that? They said, well, we really don't. We just count on people abiding by, abiding by the signs we put up. I'm like, okay. So it's in our experience that if you don't enforce something that you put in place, you will spend a number of years with the, the issue going in circles, going to various people in your municipality, sucking up an inordinate amount of time. As you all explained to them, we don't enforce it. So we're better off to just be silent on it or be able to enforce it one way or the other. I think we need to break for lunch. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>